I've just found something, I think, hidden in here. Isn't that weird? Look. That is definitely something. Can you see what I'm looking at? It's just down here and it looks like a beautiful piece of Samian ware, Roman pottery, like fine dining tableware. And look, it's got a little rabbit or a hare on it. Now I've got a few pieces of Samian ware which are decorated, but I have not got one with a rabbit on. That is magnificent. Now look at this, it's broken, but you can see what it once was. And it was Vino's Lightning Cough Cure. Look at that, it's been lying there for so long, it's covered in barnacles and weed. I love these embossed bottles. I'll leave you there. And there's also, a lot of Roman pottery around here and I saw this bit look and the pattern here just catches the light it's amazing to think that some Roman potter did that centuries ago incredible What have we got here? Oh, that's nice. Do you know what? I think I've found one of these before. Edward Sharp. And there's nothing else. Is there Edward Sharp? I have a feeling he manufactured sweets. That is very nice. Okay, Mr. Edward Sharp. You're coming home with me. I'm having a really good Samian day today. Look, there's another piece here. Oh, and that one's also got a design on it. Look, look at that, a real nice chunky piece. Let's find something to give this a little rinse in. This is great. It's a little stream, perfect. Wow. It's pretty special, isn't it? And there's even a bit here in the stream. Oh, nice. Lovely slab, same wire. Oh, look at this. Oh, jawbone. I think I can see a really large piece of Samian over there, look, just here. Yeah, look at this piece. It is the home for several little creatures. Imagine that. It must be nice to live in a Roman villa if you're a little snail or an oyster.
and sure enough it's a beautiful piece and it does have some kind of design on it there which um, you might be able to see better later on. Isn't that incredible? Look, there's a cute piece of pottery here. Now what's that on there? Is that some god? Some god or other standing in the clouds? I think it could be. Now, I can see some pottery down here with some lettering on it that I haven't seen before. N-E-R. Refreshment department. Now, who are N-E-R? I wonder. N-E-R. Let's see it better now. Who could they be? Any ideas? Just listen to those skylarks. Now, do you know what? I've just seen another stopper down here, the third stopper, but it's a totally different one. Or it might not be a stopper, it might be something industrial. It's just here. What's this? Oh, no, there is, oh, there is something on there. Oh, what's that? Now, that is interesting. There's something on there. Is that a little boat? Oh, that's rather special. But maybe went in a very narrow little bottle. Maybe a perfume bottle stopper. That looks like a wallet to me. Oh yeah, nothing in it except for this photo, look. Oh, it's be a young person's wallet. Maybe they dropped it from a boat or something. I wonder who they are. There's quite a lot of nice pottery scattered around here, but I have seen something rather special I wasn't expecting to see, and it's just here. Look at this pipe bowl. A 
that's lovely. Oh, and down here is some of that pottery, which is called, um, ooh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's got that worm design on it. A worm pattern. It's cool, isn't it? Now, I can tell from the shape of this that it is an echinoid. And that is a really lovely one. Like a fossilised urchin. Ooh, that's pretty. Really see the detail on there. Oh look, we've got an old bottle here. Very, very old and very, very covered in barnacles. I'm not going to take it. It would be a shame to take away the home of all these winkles and barnacles, but it's rather pretty, isn't it? It's got rather beautiful in its old age. I'm going to show you something that I just found. You can see here where I slid actually, and the reason I slid is because I spotted this piece of, well, what I thought was a piece of colourful pipe stem, but on picking it up, I realised that actually it's made of glass. It's not pottery at all. It's definitely not pipe stem. It looks like a beautiful bead. And I'm wondering, could this possibly be a Roman glass bead. It's got three stripes down the side there, red and white. It's a lovely turquoise colour. And I found quite a lot of Roman pottery today, so could this also be Roman? I know that beads are quite difficult to date. What do you think? I'm going to take it along to my next meeting with the Fines Liaison Officer and hopefully he'll be able to give me an idea of when it dates to. Is through one of the gun ports, which is made of eight inches of iron. Each one of these gun shields weighed uh, an incredible amount in tons. I think it was 15 or 20 tons just for a single gun shield. This is the sister fort to Fort Ho, so in many respects it's, it's identical, though from the same blueprints, but. What they suffered from most out here was uh, water saturation. Unlike Who, where you can get into the magazines, it's a bit different here. So there we are, that's the, uh, down below there would have been the magazines and the accommodation for the soldiers that were garrisoned here. As you can see, it's flooded. And this happened from the moment they um, started building it. They made a steam engine to constantly pump it out. Because wet, wet gunpowder is no good.
The guns here use gunpowder, which has to be kept so dry. Is that down there? Oh, it looks like a dead, dead owl. Dead bird. Is it? Mm. It's not an owl, is it? I don't know. Yeah, it's a dead sheep. And here, over the Bridge of Terror. Not really. It's okay. We're in the courtyard. It's a perfectly circular fort. This is obviously the remains of a flagpole. In the days before radio, telephone, etc., they would send signals via this flagpole, hoist them up to send very brief messages to the guys at Fort Who. This particular bend in the river was chosen for two of possibly the most powerful forts of their time. So from a tactical point of view, any sailing ship or sort of iron, early ironclad ship of its time would have to come up the Medway from yonder slow down with the bend in the river. Not every casemate, which, of the, which this is one, this is mm -hmm. an individual casemate, no, guns were not mounted in all of them, but certainly on this one, because it's sea facing, they were called rifle RML guns, rifle muzzle loading guns, and they were colossal. This would have allowed you to move the gun, traverse the gun, and I'm not joking, these, these guns are truly colossal. That would have been the front of the carriage, this front of the barrel would have, been, would have been about here and it would have stretched, the whole gun would have stretched at least to here. Either side of the gun port there, you've got the ammunition hoists. They go straight down to the now flooded magazines. One of them would hoist up the gunpowder and the other one would hoist up the huge shell that would be rammed down the muzzle of the gun. Uh, the rate of fire of the guns was very slow, but the amount of damage that they could do in one shot was quite phenomenal. This is the first ones that they'd shoot, that would shoot at the invaders. And then, you can go around the fort. The next one would open fire. And then the next one, and then by the time we're at about this casemate here, anyone invading or coming up the river would be, a, would be in a crossfire between this fort and Who Fort. Oh yes, there she is, over there in the distance. And you'd be caught in a crossfire with these seven, eight or nine inch guns firing a colossal shell at short range. There's not much that could have survived that. So in their day, they were incredibly effective as a deterrent. And as you all know, never fired a shot in anger. The other thing I love about uh, these forts is the artisanal workmanship. <laughs> to simply make these arches, that brickwork, I mean, everything is curved. The roof is curved, the, the fort is curved, and yet they've managed to put brickwork up like that. It's just amazing. Hats off to these gentlemen.
I'm always looking for graffiti in places like this. Not modern graffiti, there's a lot of that, but graffiti that might have been made by somebody who helped build the fort or a soldier stationed on it. I'm also always looking for little things that might be hidden in the wall. And you know what? I've just found something, I think, hidden in here. Isn't that weird? Look. That is definitely something. A geo. It could cache. be. Could be a geocache, couldn't it? Yeah, be careful when you open <laughs> oh, Let's have a look. It's a camera film. Ooh. Now that's curious. Do you want to um hmm. take it out? Let's have a little look. Or maybe there's nothing in there at all, actually. Is there something in there? Mm, it feels like a camera film. <gasps> oh, if it is, it would be really... Oh, no, it's a little note. It's a little note. Oh, look. Oh, my gosh. That is so cool. Oh, look, they only put it in here in March 23. Contact... Da, 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 da. Froggy 02 and Griff 1983. Is there anything else on there? No. No. Oh, hang on a minute. Does that 1983? Oh no, that, that that's, must be the that's the um, yeah, his tag, the, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so we could write something on there and you then bet. put put it back in the um, yeah in the in the uh, tube. That is so weird, you know, because I was thinking, well I wonder spotted. if there's anything hidden anywhere, and there it, there it was. Well spotted. Okay, well, we'll add a little note onto there, and then we'll also contact them. Hmm? Great. Uh, no, I haven't. We'll have to go back to base camp and get one. Here we are again. We've just added a little note to this little, well, what looks like a little geocache tube and I'm going to place it back in there for the next person to find. There we go. Let's put that in there as well. Cool. I love that kind of thing. Mm. What? Bird droppings. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! What is that? Oh dear. Oh dear, that's a racing pigeon ring, isn't it? I have found a few of those oops, in the past. It's a bit gruesome, isn't it? Quite a recent one from 2023, Great Britain. And it's got another little ring there as well. Oh, goodness me, that did not end well for this racing pigeon. What I can do is take the ring and then I can go onto the British Racing Pigeon Association website and, and report this one uh, as found in not a very good state. Now it's actually pouring with rain. So we're going to cook our dinner up here in the fort. No, we're all wet. No. <laughs> T-shirt. I didn't come prepared for the rain. I didn't really look at the weather forecast. It's not very clever, is it? It had 5% um, uh, shower risk. Pipe. That's a lovely. 
lovely one. I was going to say that's a nice one and a lovely one at the same time then, so it came out a lovely one. <laughs> that pretty pattern. Lovely. Goodbye, Fort Darnit. Until the next time. Everyone. Thank you very much indeed for watching. It's great to see you as always and I'm really looking forward to spending some time with you now taking a closer look at some of the treasures that you saw me find in the mud of the River Medway during an expedition out in Kent last year with my friend David. It's such a special place. I just adore the history of the River Medway and the forts who and darn it are just so very, very interesting and beautiful. The way that nature has just taken over. There's so much to learn about those forts. And so thank you very much, David, for giving us a little insight into how they worked and why they were built. So before I go into these objects here in front of me, I just wanted to check in with you and make sure that you're all well. And by the way, I don't know who needs to hear this, but if it's not all well at the moment, then don't worry, it's all going to turn out fine. It really will, believe me. But I do hope that you're all in good health and good spirits and that you are enjoying the fact that spring, at least on this side of the world, spring is on the way. If you're like me, and you can be a little bit dragged down sometimes by the dark and the cold, I mean, it looks like spring is coming, thankfully. I hope that you've taken some time to do some things this week that uh, you really enjoy, something uh, for yourself. This week, I have been out to a drained reservoir with my good mud buddy, Cy Fines. We've been out uh, looking around to see what we can find. We did a little bit of metal detecting. And I also found lots and lots of very old toys that children have obviously lost in this reservoir over the years. So I'll be doing a video about that. I also met up with some really lovely people called the Peaky Dippers. And we did some magnet fishing, which is something uh, very new to me. They're really responsible magnet fishers and they do a fantastic job of cleaning up rivers. You, you just wouldn't believe what we pulled out. Um, shopping trolleys, loads of metal, loads of things that are a real threat to wildlife and the environment. So as well as finding history, they're also doing a fantastic job. So let's take a look, first of all, at the beautiful Roman pottery. Now I got three stunning pieces of Roman Samian ware. It's also called terra sigillata, which means clay bearing images. And each three pieces that I've got here have got images on. So it was like fine dining tableware of Roman Britain. And it's wonderful when you find something like this to think of these pieces in their entirety on a Roman table full of stew, fruit and vegetables and all sorts of things. Um, and I've got my friend Richard Hemery to thank, who wrote a couple of books actually, all about pottery. Um, and I'm referring to his book called Sherd here, in which he gave a link, which I went to, uh, to see if I could find out more about the images on my Samian ware fragments. And so this one here is probably my favourite one and it has on it a hare. At first I thought it was a rabbit but it's not, it's a hare. So I went on this website, I will put the address on the screen, and searched for hares and there's lots and lots of hares on there but I think I have pinpointed the design that this hare falls under. But it's absolutely incredible. You can still see the tiny little hairs on the hare 
and there's just so much detail. It's lasted so well after all those centuries in the river. Now I did have a brief look for the designs on the other two pieces that I've got. One of them also features a hare and the snout of a dog, I think. So this is probably like a hunting scene. It's got the dog sort of chasing the hare around the bowl. And this one, I'm not absolutely certain, and I'd like to know what you think. Um, it looks to me like a person with a bird of prey. So um, maybe somebody who's hunting, who has a bird of prey, or it, maybe it's a, a god. Um, this one, I don't know. So if you feel like having a look through that uh, database to see if you can find something similar, or if you recognise it, or if you can give me any information, I would be most grateful. But what a brilliant haul of Roman Samian ware. And I've been very, very lucky over the years. I found some beautiful Samian ware, so I'll put a picture up of some of the pieces. And of course, I found a plate. Some of you may remember, those of you who watch my videos on a regular basis, you'll know I found an entire Samian ware plate. That is still with the museum at the moment, and so I'm not quite sure what is going to happen with that. And also, on the subject of Roman pottery, I'm hoping to get together with a friend of mine called Steve Trim. In the not too distant future, Steve is an expert on Roman pottery, and I'm going to have a chat with him about some of my Roman finds, and hopefully he'll be able to educate us all about the pottery and all the different types, because um, there's so many different types, and I would like to know more about them. So moving on, and still on the subject of pottery, there's this fragment here, which is quite curious. So here's another little challenge. If anybody would like to let me know what they think is on this shard of Victorian transfer ware, that would be great. A little figure there, maybe a god or a goddess. Do you recognize it? Um, now what? Ah oh, yes, the little glass stopper. I think hmm, this is definitely one of my favourite finds from that expedition. And at first I really had no idea what was on this stopper. I thought that maybe it was some uh, cygnets and a mother swan in a nest. And I also thought initially that it was a boat. Well, in fact, it's neither of those things. And maybe some of you know already, but actually what this is, is a mother pelican feeding her chicks. And it is in fact a bottle stopper, not from a bottle of perfume, but from a bottle of pelican ink. And I do have a picture of the ink bottle and that it would have been in, and it dates to around about 1896. It was drawing ink called Pelican. But I'm more interested really in what the Pelican is actually doing there. And so this sort of sent me down a really interesting rabbit hole because it is in fact the Pelican in its piety. So let me tell you a little bit about that. The pelican in her piety. What is that all about? Well, I'm going to tell you. The symbolism of the mother pelican feeding her baby pelicans is rooted in an ancient legend which preceded Christianity. The legend was that in times of famine, the mother pelican wounded herself with her beak to feed her young with her own blood, but then in turn lost her own life. So the pelican symbolises Christ who gave his blood for mankind. And in fact, there's a medieval poem which goes, Then said the pelican, If my brats be slain, with my blood I them revive. Scripture doth record the same did our Lord and rose from death to life. So interesting what you learn from a mudlarking find. And interestingly, when I was in Washington, DC, 
um, late last year, I was in a Franciscan church and I noticed up on the stained glass window a picture of a pelican in her piety, very, very similar to what's on this bottle stopper. So that is something I have learned. I had absolutely no idea um, about the symbolism of the pelican. So I hope you've enjoyed learning that too. And sticking on the theme of dead birds, um, a virtual gaze now, if you don't want to see the claw of the pigeon that I found, I've got it here, along with its ring. And I have been on the Royal Pigeon Racing Association website to register the, the pigeon that this once was. I'm on it so that the owner can be notified that his racing pigeon met a very, very sad end. Um, if you ever do find a pigeon ring, and I know metal detectorists find them quite a lot, um, you can go onto this website and there's a little form that you can fill in and this will be sent off with all the details and then the owner of the pigeon will be notified. Next, I am going to take a quick look at this bottle here with the name Edward Sharp embossed on it. And I have found one of these in the past and I recall doing some research on it. And it does actually refer to Edward Sharp, who founded Edward Sharp and Co. Toffee Manufacturers in Kent back in the late 19th century. Um, so this time I had a little bit of a Google and I went on the newspaper archives and looked up Edward Sharp and I came across a couple of clippings um, which I'm going to show you here and one of them is from 1928 when Sir Edward Sharp, the founder of the Toffee Company, actually got married for the second time in his 70s to his secretary who was called Rose. His wife had died a couple of years previously and so he found love again and got married to Rose. I don't know why, but one of the things that struck me in this article was that his son was called Herbert. And of course, this just reminds me of Sherbert, which is another kind of sweet. And I just wondered if it was something that was deliberate or whether that's my silly mind. Um, and actually his new wife is called Rose. So, you know, like Rose's chocolates. So it's all very coincidental, isn't it? Then my second Google of his name on the newspaper archives um, brought up another newspaper article three years later in 1931. Unfortunately, um, Edward Sharp actually died. So he only had three years to sort of enjoy his new love. Yeah, but at least he found love in the last three years of his life in his 70s. And actually Rose was 30 years his junior. So there we are, a little bit of miscellaneous information that um, I have sourced about Edward Sharp, and I would not know any of that if I had not found this bottle in the mud. Yes, what else have I got here in front of me? Oh yes, I have got this piece of pottery here with NER, Refreshment Department on it, and it actually refers to North East railways and I found a photograph of a cup which is in slightly better condition so I'll show you that. Um, this little bead which you saw me find I really hoped that it was going to be a Roman bead but I have asked my bead boffin friends and you may know some of them there's Monica who did the shoe a couple of weeks ago who did this the shoe restoration my friend uh, Flory of Flow Fines and Marie Louise Plum of Old Father Thames fame so they got back to me and said that it's not Roman so it's not Roman um, that dashed my hopes uh, it's probably um, well, actually, they didn't give me an age because it's very, very difficult to date beads, but it could come from London or it could come from Venice. So I need to look a little bit more into the, the history of beads. It's great having friends that know so much about them, but it just means that I get lazy then and I don't bother looking up any information myself. So I think it's about time that I 
sort of educated myself about beads. But nevertheless, it might not be Roman, but it's a very pretty glass bead and I'm sure I can do something with it. Lastly, the geocache that I got very excited about. I think I need to have a go at geocaching because I'm clearly very excited about finding things like that and messages in bottles and things. It was very exciting and I have only just very recently written to Froggy02 on the geocache website. I've signed up and written to him to let him or her know that I found their geocache. And in a few months time, I'm actually going to Chicago and I'm meeting up with a geocacher called Bryce Reed. And so maybe I'm gonna do a little bit more geocaching. Maybe I'm gonna get right into it because it actually looks like such a lot of fun just finding things all over the world, wherever you are. So what's not to like about that? Well, I think that's pretty much it in terms of my finds. And so I am looking forward to seeing you again soon with some more adventures. I was just, just trying to think actually, what is my next adventure going to be that you're going to see? I might make up my magnet fishing video actually just to make a change but I've got plenty of other adventures from the River Thames to show you and yeah so I'm really looking forward to sharing all these adventures with you. Tomorrow I'm going back to the drained reservoir again with Sci Fines and we're going to help with a big litter clear up and then we might do a bit of metal detecting afterwards. So lots and lots of plans on the horizon. I'm also going to be meeting Mudbagger again, my good friend Ard. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And I hope you've got lots of plans as well coming up. Let me know what they are in the comments below. And thank you so much for all your support, all your comments, all your emails. I'm always delighted to hear from you. And if you can help me with any of the IDs, any information about any of these objects that we've spoken about, um, then please do get in touch. So until we meet again, I'm sending you lots of love from here in London. Take care and I will see you soon. Bye. Now, I know that Squirrel hasn't been featured for a while, and also I do apologise about the dirty windows, but is it time for a bit of Squirrel? Is it? Well, look, there's lots of nuts there. Why don't you help yourself? Ooh, I wonder what's wrong with those nuts. Okay, come on then. Here you go. Obviously just wanted to be hand fed. My original Squirrel, who used to come a couple years ago, I don't know what happened to her, she's disappeared, but I seem to have inherited all her children and grandchildren and I fell out with them for a bit because they're quite um, feisty. I'll put the nut at the cat flap and then they, they try and actually get in, so I've had to calm it down a little bit. But uh, anyway, he was quite well behaved. Well, goodbye from Squirrel and I. See you soon.